which is a term of, of affection. And Gita Weirjawan also is a founder of a company, and I'm sure he'll talk about his company. He's involved in education, in the environment, in philanthropy. Um, he came to the United States after living in places like Bangladesh and in India. He came to the US for education. He got a master's degree from a school north of here, which I always have trouble pronouncing. <laughs> but um, I thought it was great that, that given your grounding this week in behavioral economics and finance, that you would get a perspective from someone who has developed really the private equity industry in a major country, led a government ministry in trade, and thought about investments for his own company, as well as how to allocate his own time, which is, of course, our most precious resource. Speaking of time, I reviewed uh, Gita's slides. They're very substantive. Um, I want to step aside. I think our format is I wanted to invite our guests to present some slides and then have a conversation. I need not be part of it. You can run the show, as they say. But before I, I step off to the side, any, any questions or comments? Are things going well? You enjoyed New York yesterday. Which did you? Which part did you like the most? <laughs> Hearst, <laughs> truly global company. Yeah. How about the Lincoln Center? Who was that great negotiations professor? Credit Swiss. So, all right. So good to have you all here. We're so happy that you're here for this week. Gita Wierzer, all right. Thank you. Thank you all. It's it's a real honor to be here, and thank you, Ted, for saying the introductory words uh, for me. I'm I'm a little nervous because I I've never spoken at a prestigious school like Yale University. But a uh, long time ago when people in the US try to pronounce my name, uh, I always tell them, just think of guitar without an R. And my last name just say, what do you want? <laughs> and it, it worked. <laughs> it, it, it worked. I'll but remember it, that. It, it never really helped with my salary increase. Uh, but uh, it, it got me through. Uh, anyway, I, I just got out of the government. I was in the government of uh, the Republic of Indonesia for five years so as uh, the Minister of Trade. And before that, I was running the Investment Coordinating Board, uh, which is equivalent to the Ministry of Investment. And before that, I was, I was an entrepreneur for about 16 months. I was doing quite well between 2008 until 2009. And then I got summoned by the then president uh, for a massive pay cut. Just to give you a perspective, if you're working for the Indonesian government, you make about $1,500 per month, uh, plus a sack of rice. And it's, it's supposed to be a real honor. Uh, and it was an honor for me to be off uh, the Indonesian government for five years. So before that, I was in banking. I worked at JP Morgan uh, for some years. I was with Goldman Sachs for almost six years. And I was at Citi for five years. And I worked for a wholly owned subsidiary of Tomasic in Singapore for one year. Uh, but now I'm back in the private sector, uh, running the business group that I set up. I want to just talk a little bit, you know, Southeast Asia and Indonesia. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to say that it's, it's, it's a unique time uh, as of now, uh, having seen the world evolve. You know, it took the population of the world 12,000 years to go from one million to the first billion. 
And the first billion was hit in the 1800s, to be exact, uh, around 1800. And it took a lot faster for the world population to get to the next billion, only 130 years. Then the next billion only took 35 years. Then the next billion took only 19 years. And ever since then, it's only taken 12 to 15 years for the world population to grow by another billion. And we're at over 7 billion today. And the question is, where is the world economy going to go? Where is the environment going to go? Where is the politics going to go? Where is the geopolitics going to go? Southeast Asia is just a small piece of the equation. It is a population of a little over 600 million people made up of 10 countries. And it shares a lot of similarities among its members, including Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar, and Brunei, of course. Uh, it's only about $2.5 trillion of economy in the context of over $70 trillion in the whole world. You compare that with another grouping in Europe, which has a little over 500 million people, uh, but they share, I think, fewer similarities in terms of culture, in terms of politics, in terms of ethnic background, in terms of a few other things. The European Union has decided to unionize uh, on a number of attributes, including immigration, labor, and monetary matters, whereas ASEAN is almost completely different. It doesn't unionize in fiscal nor immigration, nor monetary, nor customs, nor labor. But it sits on three different pillars. These three pillars are socio-cultural, economic, and political security. And it has been underpinning the stability of the region since the late 70s. It was founded in 1967, and ever since then, I think ASEAN has enjoyed tremendous stability in terms of economic robustness. Until 1998, we had an episodic stress by way of what's happening in some parts of Asia, and there was a, an effect, and Indonesia collapsed. It contracted by 13% in 1998, the economy, and it also got a new taste of democracy. That was the time when Indonesia first learned how to democratize. Before then, everything was run by just one guy by the name of Suharto, who ruled the country for 32 years as a dictator. But ever since then, I think Indonesia has learned to democratize and learned to become more relevant of not only ASEAN, but of the world. Just to give you a sense, during the regime of the first president, Sukarno, the GDP per capita was only $200. When came Habibi, who ruled for just a little short of two years, the GDP didn't grow much. It actually collapsed. Sorry, Sukarno went to Suharto. Suharto took it from $200 to $1,200, then the Asian financial crisis brought it down to $600, and we had presidents of Habibi, Megawati, and Gustur, who basically was able or were able to take the GDP per capita from $600 to $1,100. That was in 2004 when President SBY took over. He was a military guy and was de democratically elected by a little over 200 million people and was able to ramp up the GDP per capita or income per capita from $1,100 to around $3,500 to $3,600. So it has been three times of growth in 10 years. And we had a new president last year by the name of Joko Widodo who basically got democratically elected 
on a sound footing and is just in his first year of uh, ruling. And time will tell as to whether or not Indonesia will be able to grow. Now, if we take a look at Indonesia, it is a little short of a trillion dollar economy. It is the 16th largest economy in the world on a nominal GDP basis. Whereas on a PPP adjusted basis, it's probably number 10 or number 11 in the world. But not a whole lot of people know about Indonesia. Most people know more about Bali, and that's actually in Indonesia, for some of you who don't know where Bali is. And Bali has been much more of an attraction to the world over than Indonesia has been because of its unique nature of uh, tourist uh, destination. Taking a glance at Indonesia's fundamentals, We've had pretty consistent GDP growth between five to 7% in the last 10 years with the exception of 2008 when we grew only 4.5%. And beyond the last 10 years, we contracted about 13% in 1998. But relative to the other ASEAN nations of the Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore and Thailand, which are some of the bigger neighbors of Indonesia and Southeast Asia, We've had a little more stability in terms of its economic trajectory. We're rapidly urbanizing. There's about 130 million people that are living in the cities out of the 255 million people in Indonesia. Fast forward, in 2035, people are predicting that we're gonna have close to 200 million people living in the cities. That's gonna mean more requirements of infrastructure development, ports, airports, railroads, power generation capabilities, and all that good stuff. The middle class is growing. There is about 60 million middle class members in Indonesia. Income per capita is also growing, but equity may not be there as much as the growth of income in general in Indonesia. It's not a highly banked economy. If you take a look at the equity market, the banking industry, and the bond market, they only make up around 107% of the GDP. If you compare that with Malaysia at 450% and Singapore at 564%, it tells you how well capitalized Malaysia and Singapore are. Indonesia is pretty much at the same level as the Philippines, which is another robust economy in Southeast Asia. And I think this, this will entail questions as to how we're gonna be able to ramp up the percentage of the degree of the banking system in the country and the equity market of the economy and also the bond market. We've had, some interesting phenomenon uh, recently. Uh, I think what I see is an increasing divergence of monetary policy making around the world. We've had the QE here. We've had the Japanese version of QE. We had the European version of QE. And we've just seen the Chinese version of QE just months ago. And I don't see central bankers around the world and policymakers around the world talking to each other and coordinating as much as we would have seen some years ago. And this has, I think, entailed more risk for countries like Indonesia. And we've seen capital moving back to the US by way of expectation of an interest rate rise here. Uh, so I've been assigned to talk about behavioral economics, economics which is really the study of economics from the point of view of psychological, cognitive, social, and emotional factors. And lately, I think some people in Asia have gotten a little more emotional than usual because money has been moving out of Asia and moving back to another place which is anticipated to increase interest rates. This is worrisome. 
for some economies of Asia. I think the issue with Indonesia is not only monetary, but it is also fiscal. Fiscal in the sense that are we going to be able to collect tax revenues as, as much as we have been? Mind you, this is a country that is largely commodity driven. 70% of its budget has been hinging on energy and commodities. And at the rate that it's struggling to diversify away from the commodities, uh, I think we need to find solutions on how to game change the fiscal space of this country, in addition to how to deal with some neighboring countries who might do their own version of quantitative easing, uh, which certainly has and will have an effect on economies like Indonesia. This tells you how vulnerable we are. 50 to 60% of the markets is basically owned and dominated by foreign money. And foreign money, as of today, is looking for the right places. And it's a bit ironic in that capital today is actually very cheap, and we're likely to see a sustained period of low interest rate environment, but we're not capitalizing on this to the extent that investment realization as of 2002, 2015 is only growing by 9% when in the past we were able to grow at 30 to 35%. And for those who know a bit about Indonesia versus China. China runs at a fixed capital formation ratio of 50%, whereas Indonesia runs at a fixed capital formation ratio of only 32%. And I think it needs to move up the needle from 32% to anywhere around 40% if we were to be able to or to want to improve the quality of the infrastructure and the quantity of the infrastructure also. So at the rate that we're not getting investments from around the world as much as we used to, uh, I think we need to rejig the economic uh, structure or formula uh, for the country. And this will have an effect on Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia is highly influenced by the stability or the quality of economic trajectory in Indonesia, which makes up about 40 to 45% of Southeast Asia's economy. As you can see, the bottom five in US dollar terms, the capital markets of Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia have been affected. You see that the Philippine stock market has corrected by almost 1% this year in dollar terms. And the STI, which is the Singapore stock market, has corrected 11%. Thailand stock market has corrected almost 15%, Indonesia is 18%, and Malaysia by 26%. And that has been largely because of just expectations of interest rates rise in the US and the recent devaluation or quantitative easing in China. So episodic stresses are more and more recurring, frequent, and apparent in Asia. <laughs> Having said that, if you take a look at the last 15, 16, 17 years, it's been a pretty good run. In 1998, our market capitalization was only 20 billion US, less than the worth of Bill Gates at that time. As of today, the market cap has gone up to about 400 billion US which is still 40% of our GDP, which is not efficient. I mean, my definition of efficiency usually is at about 100% of its GDP. And anything above 100% is good, having market capitalization at at least 100% of your GDP. So we've got ways to go in terms of our growth trajectory. And by way of what we may potentially see in the next year, two, or three, depending on how you define how the renormalization of monetary policy in the US is going to go, 
we're talking about a potential increase of 200 to 250 basis points here. That will certainly have an effect on a number of economies in Asia. Okay, this is another behavior that's worth observing. There's basically only 27 million people in Indonesia that are paying taxes or supposed to be paying taxes. You put that in the context of 255 million people. Right there you know there's a lot of people who are not paying taxes, right? And if you take a look at the ratio of tax, meaning the ratio of tax revenues vis-a-vis -vis the GDP of the country, it's only at 10.8%. To give you perspective, the average OECD country runs at a tax ratio of 30%, right? But here's, here's the good part. Even with a ridiculously low tax ratio, the corporates in Indonesia are paying 25% tax. And if you're publicly listed, they're actually paying 20%. So if you're not publicly listed, you're paying 25% tax. And if you're listed, you pay only 20%. So imagine if we were to grow the tax ratio from 10.8% to let's say 15, or even 20%. I mean, we're talking about the potential of our being able to lower tax rates to maybe 10%. We could be highly, highly competitive vis-a-vis -vis the Singapores and the Hong Kongs of the world. So this is, I think, the lingering question for policymakers or anybody that wants to be participatory in the economic story of Indonesia. I've been quite vocal in advocating for a tax amnesty. And that, I believe, is one way to game change the fiscal space of Indonesia. I think it's gonna be difficult. It's gonna take a long time for us to reconfigure the structure of our fiscal space from commodities-centric to non-commodity-centric. We can do it, but it's gonna take time. And I'm not sure if time is on our side. One way to game change the fiscal space is to just do a tax amnesty. And it's likely that the parliament is gonna be approving of a potential tax amnesty bill in the next three to six months. When that happens, it's gonna provide both a fiscal solution and also a monetary solution. A fiscal solution because you'll have a lot more people paying taxes or at least showing up for new tax IDs and they'll start paying taxes. And a monetary solution because we know or we speculate that there's quite a number of Indonesians that have not been reporting taxes and have been parking their money outside Indonesia. And that's likely to return and provide some liquidity support into the system. Less than 11% poor tax compliance. We compare this with other countries. The Philippines runs at a tax ratio of 13%. Singapore, 13%. There's a lot higher percentage of the population that are paying taxes in Singapore, but they run on a more efficient tax rate, lower tax rates for the corporates and the individuals. Malaysia at 16% of the GDP, Thailand at 16%, the US of A, 24%, OECD average, 33%, and France. Anybody from France here? Okay, wanna think of migrating to Indonesia because we're low? <laughs> 44%, so that's, that's the highest tax ratio you know, in the world. So I think uh, there are opportunities and there are challenges uh, for Indonesia. My, my view is that the world is changing 
And I think in the near foreseeable future, by way of what we might be seeing in terms of an interest rate increase in the U.S., uh, the dollar is viewed to be the currency that's going to be strengthening vis-a-vis uh, -vis just about any currency in the world, particularly those in Asia. So it just seems that globally, economically, the world is likely to be more Americanized in the near foreseeable future. But in contrast to that, uh, geopolitically, the U.S. is playing less and less of a role. And geopolitically, the world is becoming less Americanized than ever by way of what we're seeing in the Middle East, what we're seeing in the South China Sea, what we're seeing around the U.S. even, and what we're seeing in Europe. So I think uh, the world is going to be even more interesting uh, in the next few years. Uh, and I think we just need to make sure that places like Southeast Asia would stay relevant. This is another discussion on tax, which I've touched on earlier. There you go. This is where the challenge is. When we talk about Indonesia's fiscal space, the budget in terms of what the tax revenues are supposed to be for 2015 is 1,294 trillion rupees. That's a lot of zeros, but it's pretty much equivalent to about 100 billion US, almost. But look at the collection. Until the end of August, only 46% of the target has been collected. So if you extrapolate the next four months of 2015, it's going to be very difficult to collect the remaining 54%, which I think poses the question as to whether or not we're going to be fiscally robust. We have been fiscally robust for the last 10 years, thanks to the commodities boom. But without that, and with what we're seeing in the Middle East, I think oil price is likely to stay low for the near foreseeable future. So 2015 is a question mark. 2016 is, again, likely to be a question mark in terms of our ability to collect taxes, which is why some, including myself, have advocated for a game-changing tax amnesty. Beyond that, what would a country like Indonesia do from a non-fiscal standpoint? I don't see any reason as to why Indonesia would not consider its own version of quantitative easing at the rate that everybody else is doing or contemplating doing its own version of quantitative easing. I'm speculating, I think China is likely to do another round of quantitative easing in the early part of 2016. That, I think, will bear some challenges for neighboring countries in Asia and I think will probably make some neighboring countries do their own version of quantitative easing. Now, the challenge for Indonesia is that it's unique and different from other countries who are experiencing deflationary pressure environment, whereas Indonesia has been inflationary, even this year, when commodities prices are actually at a low time and all-time low. So the key is how do we make sure that prices are stable. 30 to 40 percent of the consumer price index for Indonesia is actually related to food staples. And a good chunk of the food staples as a determinant of inflation is actually chili. Because Indonesians love spicy food. And when we run out of chili, we actually import chili from places like India, Thailand, and Vietnam. So if anybody in the policymaking body were to want to do any quantitative easing, putting liquidity in the market, he or she needs to make sure that price stability is there. Better yet, 
there should be some deflationary tendencies. So he or she should be mindful of how to manage and control price levels of the food staples. Uh, here's the problem. The problem is the government has been tended, tending to be a little bit nationalistic as of late. Protectionist policies are pervasive. So this is where I think if anybody were to consider doing some sort of quantitative easing, he or she would have to sound a lot less nationalistic because they need to open up the gates for importation of food staples as to help bring about stability on prices. The last bit is TPP. You've probably heard this. There's been a lot of sound bites on Trans-Pacific Partnership. I was the Minister of Trade at that time. I was put on a spot when we had a meeting with uh, the leadership of the United States. And I was asked as to whether or not Indonesia would be willing and ready to join. And at that time, my position was we were not able to ascertain as to whether or not this would be net beneficial for Indonesia. Merely or mainly for the reasons that 70% of our exports are actually commodities. And these commodities are actually going to places like China and India, mainly. Coal, bauxite, you name it. And there's not a whole lot of stuff going off to the US other than garments, shoes, and to some extent, cigarettes at that time. And at the same time, we were buying Boeings from the US. And all the airlines in Indonesia, which have been doing very well, you know, have been ordering hundreds of Boeing 737s and 777s and all this, all the other uh, Boeing types. So it has to be clear for anybody to be signing on to a TPP in that he or she ought to be able to justify it politically. When you run a bilateral discussion or a plurilateral discussion or even a multilateral discussion, you've got to be very clear that you've got to get it past the stakeholders. And the stakeholders in Indonesia have become a little more democratic than ever. And they get unique when they get democratic. And it's not easy lately to pass anything that doesn't visibly get quantified in terms of benefits for the actual people in Indonesia. So we took the view of not participating in the TPP. And this is actually a beautiful concept, uh, conceptually. 40% of the global GDP being participatory in this partnership being made up of 12 countries on the Pacific. But if you take a look at ASEAN, not everybody signed up. Singapore signed up. Singapore will benefit either way because it is a hub of goods and services. So anything that passes through with high tariff or low tariff or no tariff will benefit Singapore. Whereas Brunei, it's 300,000 people and not too significant of a size economically. Uh, it also, I think, is taking the view that either way it would benefit. But Indonesia, being the largest component of Southeast Asia, didn't sign up. The Philippines, which has been known as very friendly and close to the US, even took the view of not signing up. And I think to be fair, this was an initiative that was sounded off some years ago. At that time, it was hard to tell. And this was viewed not merely as a trade or economic platform, but this was viewed to some extent as a geopolitical platform, as a counter to China. And at that time, China was spearheading its own discussions with a number of partners from Asia uh, we called it the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, in short, RCEP. And my view at that time was that RCEP was a little too 18th century. 
and TPP was a little too 22nd century. And it would have been easier to recalibrate up from an 18th century proposition as opposed to trying to recalibrate down from a 22nd century. Because if you take a look at the documents or the drafts of the TPP, I mean, we're talking about lots of stuff on intellectual property and, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, foreign language to a lot of people in Indonesia. When you mention the words intellectual property, when everybody's just trying to extract coal, bauxite, and build shirts and shoes. So that was really the position or the situation at that time. And I think as of now, with the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of this being basically signed off and likely to be executed as early as next year, hopefully, when 12 countries would have ratified the agreement in each one of the 12 countries, uh, I think it would be easier for countries like Indonesia to further study this quickly and uh, decide on whether or not uh, we should sign on. And, and I think there's some room for us to not only study the proposal a little more thoroughly, but there's room for us to try to recalibrate to wherever we need to be. Thank you very much. Well, great, Any thank questions? you. Uh, so I, let me ask one question and yep. then uh, we'll open it up. Um, so if we, if we agree with the, with the following proposition that um, Indonesia would be wealthier if it would move away from being so dependent on natural resources, if it would have greater tax compliance, maybe less nationalistic, would be able to deal with its corruption issues, and shift to a more human capital oriented economy, more open, more globally competitive, more tax compliance with a lower tax rate, all that leads to greater wealth. Do it, I don't know, how, how many people would buy into that proposition? More wealth for Indonesia? As, a, as both somebody who is in the private sector obviously committed to Indonesia, you've had the government experience. How, what's the biggest barrier to making that kind of shift? You know, what, what made it work for me when I was in the government was to tell people that Indonesia was corrupt and uh, was for me to tell people that Indonesia is not as educated as some others in the region. Uh, and what I was selling was not the absolute. Uh, wh what I was selling was directionality. And, and, and my next follow-up question would be, you know, what you think at the rate that we're spending, we're doing this much to this extent, would you think that five years from today, Indonesia is gonna be more or less corrupt? Would you think that Indonesia five years from today would be more or less educated? And, and I, would, I would socialize the numbers with any audience that was you know, talking to me. And I'll, I'll put this in perspective. Uh, we changed the, the laws some years ago as to spend up to 20% of our budget on education until not too long ago, we're spending no more than 3% of our budget on education. So we game changed it with a law that would basically require that we spend 20% of our budget on education. Now, if, if we were to extrapolate our government budget from today until 20 years from today with the GDP growth of four to 5%, cumulatively, that 20% of the government budget that's gonna be spent on education is gonna be 2.4 trillion US dollars. Now, wouldn't you think with 2.4 trillion dollars that you're gonna have cumulatively in the next 20 years, you would be able to or you would not be able to fill up this room with Indonesians? 
I mean, I could fill up any campus around the world with Indonesians, but the sad part is there's not a whole lot of Indonesians attending Yale, uh, attending the schools north of here, west of here, or anywhere around the world. We only have 40,000 PhDs. Uh, India has close to a million PhDs. China has close to a million PhDs. India is producing close to a million engineers per year. Indonesia is not nearly you know, to, to that extent. And, and you, you put yourself you know, in the box to think of where you want to take this economy. This is a trillion dollar economy, close to a trillion dollar economy, with fantastic demographic bonus because 60% of our population are younger than 39 years old. 50% of our population are younger than 29 years old. And we like to reproduce. Because probably there's lots of blackouts and brownouts because we don't have <laughs> electricity enough in many parts. Uh, take a 15 year view. The demographic profile of Indonesia is gonna, sp is gonna be the same. Stay young. But the problem is 40% of our population are stunting and they're not getting enough nutrition. They're not getting enough education. So we're just probably gonna blow away this opportunity unless and until we do something that's game changing uh, from, from an educational standpoint and from a storytelling standpoint. Yeah, let me follow up on the storytelling part because how do you frame this to get it to work for the, I don't really want to say average Indonesian because I don't, there may not be one. Uh, but let me contrast two different ways to frame this and see which one you tend to gravitate to. One is Indonesia is a major success story. And to make the, make the, the change and to allow it continue, to continue, we need to do those things. But we should feel good about ourselves and to keep it going, do these things. The other is to focus on competition. Look at the gap we have compared to, and you name the, the particular country. As a, as a policymaker who cares so deeply about Indonesia, which of those do you tend to gravitate to and which do you think works better? Or I, like, I like the latter because it, it keeps you on your toes, right? If, if, if you not so happy talk. Not so happy talk because you know, if, if you don't think about that constantly, then I think you lose sight of perspective. You lose sight of what you need, what you need to be doing. And, and it's, it's the, I think it's the constant comparison with your neighbors in Southeast Asia and your neighbors in Asia. I think, uh, you know, I think in, in Indonesia with 250 million people, the third biggest democracy in the world, the fourth most populous country in the world, doesn't get talked about enough on CNN or anywhere unless there's an earthquake or there's a tsunami. I think it's a mockery, but it's an easy fix. We just need to have a handful of people talking about it, telling the story the right way. I, I think that the biggest mistake would be for someone to just be going out and tell the world that it's perfect. No, it's not perfect. Because how the hell are you gonna be able to absorb the jobs that are gonna be dislocated from, uh, from and by China as they move up the value chain? Because at the end of the day, the conversation will be about whether or not you're marginally productive whether or not you're marginally efficient, whether or not you're more marginally productive than your neighbors. And then that, I think, is the difficult conversation because we can't. Yes, we can brag about the fact that our labor cost per day is only $8 versus China's 30 to $35 per day. Vietnam is at nine to $10. We're cheap, but are we as mar marginally productive as the others? I think that's a difficult conversation. And when you reviewed the the picture of the EU approach versus the ASEAN approach, you pointed out that ASEAN is not a union. Yeah. And how does that play into what you think ought to be the narrative for Indonesia? It, are, are there particular reference countries that you focus on 
when you talk about Indonesia's competitiveness and where you believe Indonesia needs to be compared to what country or well, countries? China is always you know, a, a reference. India is always a reference. Uh, these two countries have been fantastic in, in producing good, educated, and productive people uh, and entrepreneurial people. Uh, yes, they've got issues, but these are issues that I think they can fix. We've got issues, uh, and these are issues that I think we can fix. I've talked about some of these deferred costs that Indonesia has to bear, but I'm, I'm of the view that if, if we were to just be able to game change one or two things, I think we can fix this. And it, put this in a, in a next 50 year context, it's fixable. So I'm not, I'm not too worried, I'm, I'm, I'm a glass half full. Okay. So I'd love to open it up to questions from those in the, in the network week. And I, I failed to mention and cover Gita's uh, work in the private sector, his work as a f philanthropist and uh, all kinds of things. You, you probably know about him, so feel free to ask questions that may go beyond his very interesting presentation. How about in the next and last row there, yes. And please just say, say who you are and where you're from, if you would. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for the insightful discussion. I'm from India, and I'm currently studying in the Philippines. Uh, my question is more around the concerns that you presented regarding uh, the tax, uh, the low tax to GDP ratio at 10.8%, and uh, the nationalistic nature, which is eventually not leading to meet the, gov the fiscal budget. So how effective and successful and sustainable do you think a, mon uh, uh, a quantitative easing policy would be to help take Indonesia to the next level? You know, I just thought about it on my car ride here. You know, it's not something that I've been talking about. Uh, uh, and and I, I think this could work. Uh, you know, I've been talking about the, the tax amnesty for the last four years, and I, I've spoken with enough people in the last four years, and finally it, it caught on. And it, it's looking like it's likely to get legislated in the next three to six months. So with regards to the quantitative easing, uh, it's something that I think we've got to be prepared to do because I'm not seeing a stop uh, on stuff like this uh, with, you know, the neighboring countries. Uh, we've seen this happening in the U.S., in Europe, in Japan, in China. And I'm, I think I'm seeing real probability of this happening again in China, uh, whether it's going to take the route of a devaluation or more liquidity being infused to the system. Uh, so if, if somebody does that in your neighborhood, uh, you've got to make yourself competitive, right? Uh, how do you make yourself competitive from a currency standpoint? So you've got to, I think, of liquefying your economy. The, the caveat would be moral hazard, because uh, this is a banking system of, what, four or 500 billion US? You want to pump in 50 to 100 million US worth of additional liquidity? You want to make sure that the financial intermediation really does its job in terms of translating that liquidity into the right pockets, the masses and all that. And you've got to make sure that prices don't go up whenever, whenever there's more liquidity. And, and I did talk about the price level being driven to a large extent by food staples. So I think that's, that's where I think this has to be managed more carefully because we have not been able to manage inflation because we have been overly nationalistic. We've been closing the gates. No, we don't want to import cattle from Australia. We don't want to import spice from Thailand. We don't want to import rice from Thailand and all that. So I think we've got to change the rhetoric and we've got to change the posture. And if we do that, I think we can manage inflationary pressure a little bit better. I think we stand a good chance in being able to liquefy the, equ the economy whenever uh, you know, it's needed. So, how about right here? Yes, please. Um, and please identify yourself. Thank you. Excuse me, Paul Penny uh, from Ireland. Uh, I was just wondering, you spoke about MCM and the macro regime model that the European uses. Is that something that's reflective of the country, the economy in Southeast Asia, or is that, do you believe, an ideological urge of the Union model? I, I don't think it's so much um, 
ideologically driven. Uh, you know, ASEAN or Asians, they're very courteous and respectful people. I mean, I don't mean it as a bragging thing, but uh, we, we respect each other. Uh, and we took the view in 1967 uh, that let's just focus on the political security. Let's focus on the socio-cultural. Let's focus on the economy. And the economy was only about trade and investment, right? But look at what's happening to Europe now. They decided to unionize uh, immigration, but now the Schengen is no longer valid. Uh, there is no people movement of uh, freedom as there was, you know, until a few weeks ago when we saw this huge refugee, you know, phenomenon. Uh, does that help understand better the comparison between our sort of, you know, congregation vis-a-vis -vis the European congregation? I think it does now. Uh, and, and I think we, we chose uh, the right approach. Uh, and, and I think we're gonna go at the way we've been. Uh, doing it. I, I think we're respectful of each other's idiosyncrasies, but also similarities. Yes, right here. Well, I, I think economically, uh, China is too far ahead of us. Uh, India is too far ahead of us. Uh, and I think Brazil, uh, well, I'm not, I know there's probably Brazilians there, but I think, uh, let me this be. This is the problem, you know, with this kind of crowd, we always have to be worried. <laughs> Brazil, Everybody's great. <laughs> Brazil looks a lot like Indonesia. It's blessed with natural resources, and it's blessed with a lot of beaches, right? And, and, and it's, it's going through some issues economically and also politically. Uh, not that Indonesia is doing fantastically on two fronts, uh, but I think if there is a country that we want to be like, uh, Brazil has shown its wherewithal to industrialize, you know, they make airplanes, they make cars, they make all kinds of stuff, and they make a lot of cattle. I've, I've been to Brazil many times, and, and they have 200 million cows, vis-a-vis uh, -vis 190 million people, and Indonesia only has 15 million cows, vis-a-vis -vis 255 million people. So why do I talk about cows? Because it's protein. Indonesia needs a lot of protein, uh, you know, in order to, move up uh, on the intellectual uh, ladder. So I, I think that could be a, a natural uh, next uh, logical choice. Yeah. Very interesting. How about right here, yes. And, and we're, I, I was reminded to ask you to push down your mic as well. So two, two requests, identify yourself and mic up. Uh, so this is Archan from the Asian Institute of Management. Uh, I belong to India. Uh, it's a two-part question, sir. So just connected to what uh, the previous question, uh, I saw that uh, Singapore's tax ratio was 13.8 as against Indonesia's, which was 10.5. So obviously Singapore is doing something right and belonging to the same region. So when you, as a policymaker, when you benchmark yourself against other economies or other geographies, which particular benchmark do you look at? Again, China, India are, as you said, way ahead of you, but as, as someone who, who you would look to benchmark, which country would it be? In terms of? To, in terms of growth. And uh, second so, part. So, so can we just pause there? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm gonna uh, kibitz a little bit and, uh, friendly. If I understood your, your, your factual presentation, the way Singapore is getting to that 13% is the important part. High, part, high participation, high compliance rate, and relatively low taxes. Correct. And that's, this is what you wanted to focus on? Yes, on the tax part, yes. Okay. So the question is, so what, the question what is sort since, of? Since, since Singapore is doing well, even with a low tax ratio, right. uh, 
what would Indonesia do as a country to reach those same growth levels? It's uh, the tax amnesty will get us there. Uh, you may think, or some of you may think that, you know, a lot of people may not want to register uh, for this sort of stuff. But I do, I do believe that there is enough uh, Indonesians out there who are not paying taxes or who are not living in Indonesia. Uh, they're not thinking of themselves anymore because they're, they're already well off. They're thinking of their kids. They're thinking of their grandkids, and they want to make sure that their kids and grandkids live happily ever after in Indonesia. And I think they want to be as compliant as, as possible. So this is, I think, uh, the catch. So, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, the, the storytelling has to be right. Uh, I mean, carefully crafted also. The opportunity of being able to lower tax rates to a much more competitive level is huge from an entrepreneurial standpoint. This is, I think, the bigger catch. So, so imagine where we could be if we were to be able to increase the tax ratio from 10.8 to, let's say, 15% in the next 10 years. Boy, I think we could have some of the most competitive tax rates in Asia. Please forgive me. I'm going to make sure we can see, hear other voices. Uh, we'll try to get your question after, okay? Yes, please. Sir, I'm Sumit, and uh, I'm coming from Smurfit School, Ireland. My question is regarding the conduciveness of uh, Indonesian economy for m manufacturing industries, particularly. Like, how conducive is the environment there? Or better put, how conducive the environment has been made to attract some of the major manufacturing industries, like offloading them out from China or maybe India to Indonesia. What has then been the effort in this direction? We've, we've got youth, we've got literacy, we've got vocational capabilities, we've got good basic educational capabilities. We don't have as much tertiary education capabilities as perhaps in India or in China. But for basic manufacturing of automotive and others, uh, I think vocational and non-tertiary uh, would be adequate. I think the, conf the confusing part or the parts that undermine the thesis uh, would include the fact that we don't tell the story right and we flip-flop on policies and we tend to confuse people. And to, to some extent, the, the productivity or the marginal productivity part is what. Uh, but, but if you were in China, uh, you want to dislocate and relocate, uh, you would want to look for scale. And this is a country with 250 million people uh, and good basic you know, infrastructure. Uh, logically, you would opt for that. But in the absence of clearly crafted stories, or rhetoric or policy making, then you start shaking. Then you start thinking of other places like Costa Rica, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, or even India. So then, then that's, that's where I think the competition gets, gets a little more interesting. But, but I think it's generally conducive, but if, if we were to compare ourselves with an ASEAN, I think Vietnam, I think, tells it a little bit better than we do. And, and, and they've, they've gotten on uh, board with some, I think, interesting platforms uh, such as the TPP, which, which I think is, is a highly benefiting uh, trade proposition for Vietnam. We have time for uh, just one more question, and uh, right here from... Thank you very much, guys. Um, my name is Toju, and I'm from the Lagos Business School, Nigeria. Um, I have two quick questions. The first, well, I, I'm going to have to limit you to one. All right, pick, I'll, I'll pick, go, pick, pick I'll one, go my to, friend. All right, sir. I'll go to the most important one. And my question is, um, we, we're seeing that the world is becoming increasingly a global community. But I'd like to know what, what do you think would drive an interdependent but yet resilient economy? In the sense that an economy that trades with everybody but yet um, tribes are missed the uncertainties around us. Sorry, I, I missed the last part. 
Um, my question is, what, what do you think is that factor? What are the basics that would cause an economy to be interdependent but yet resilient amidst the re um, uncertainties in the world? Interdependent and? And resilient. resilient. Oh, resilient, okay. So we're, we're already a not so small part of a supply chain for at least Southeast Asia and to a pretty large degree Asia, right? That makes you pretty relevant, right? And that makes you to some extent interdependent uh, on others uh, for exports and imports because you're a big part of the supply chain of lots of people uh, in, in Indonesia, I mean in Asia. Um, I think resiliency is a part that I think requires the continuation of robust fiscal space. And this means, I think, a lot. This, this entails a few other variables. Uh, without a sustainable, robust fiscal space, you're not going to be able to be as resilient as you want. Uh, and this is where we have talked about in terms of the revenue generating uh, aspects of your fiscal space. How do you make sure that not only do you have growth on your fiscal space, but you have diversification? I think we've had growth for the last 40 years in terms of our fiscal space. We've grown tax collection five times in the last 10 years. Don't get me wrong, I think we've done pretty well in tax collection. You know, 10 years ago, our tax collection was only one fifth of what we are collecting today. But I've pointed out how we can actually further game change that. Because if we were to move up in increments, small or big, we're gonna be able to educate more people. We're gonna be able to build more bridges. We're gonna be able to build infrastructure. That will, I think, translate to your ability to be resilient. But also the diversification of your fiscal space. You can't just simply rely on one source of revenue. You've got to be able to move up the value chain. This is where I think the challenge is. The challenge is that we're not capturing the more, if not the much more value additive thesis on the value chain from other countries that are potentially or actually dislocating that sort of thesis onto us. So without this diversification, we may not have the kind of sustained growing fiscal space, and I think that will make us less resilient. Because at any time you have episodic stress, a tsunami or a financial tsunami from an Asian neighbor or a European neighbor or an American neighbor, you're gonna be exposed because you're gonna to have to be in a position to stimulate the economy. And to stimulate the economy, you're gonna need wallet. Without that, you're not gonna be relevant and resilient. And, and you can do it from a monetary standpoint by printing money. But again, I pointed out the challenges and the risks of doing a quantitative easing because you've got to make sure that price levels don't go up because if price levels go up more than necessarily, you're not going to be able to print money. You're not going to be able to devalue your currency as easily as we might have seen in this part of the world, Europe, Japan, and China. So. I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you for your questions. I found them very interesting. Uh, often uh, I like to just reflect out loud about what I'm thinking about and learning from these kinds of conversations. And I'll just say that I think this last question tied things together quite well. And if I could uh, add in to these uh, very interesting comments, um, I think policy matters. And uh, I, th I would agree with Gita that having that, that financial flexibility in times of crisis is, is very important because you can have a lot of progress and then have big setbacks. Uh, countries have different, different uh, initial conditions, different resources. And, and one of the arts of leadership, I think, by country is to figure out how to move policy forward given those things. Some of you may have heard of the curse of natural resources. 
And I think that reflects a view that human capital is the most important type of capital in a modern economy. So this move from 4% to 20%, how can you sustain that? How can you make that long-term investment in, in human capital, which if you're a politician, doesn't, doesn't reward you in the, ne in the next year. <laughs> it takes a long time. But good policy matters, the ability to adjust, and I think that's the other thing that I find very interesting about this last question. And as you get to know each other better and stay connected, it's good to, to reflect on which countries are able to craft good policy and make adjustments and stay resilient. You take Latin America, there's so much divergence in policy. Just take that region and so much divergence in this ability to adjust and make performance. You've mentioned several countries in the course of your talk. So I think that's a fascinating um, topic and subject matter in which to end, but also to continue our, our global network conversation. Let me just say thanks to all of you again for being at Yale. Um, Gita, thank you for being here. Please join me in welcome. Congrats, guys. Gita, Part of a great Juwan. program. Thank you. And am I right? We, we're going to have a bit of a reception downstairs? Is that true?